Uh, I want to say Tan Se and Tan Shi and Tawao. Welcome everyone for joining us uh, here for being Oki Chi Tawao, uh, being a warrior, uh, Indigenous Men's Perspective Panel. Uh, I'd like to uh, say that this panel is presented by Kihi Watson Indigenous Center, uh, and the panel is offered as a part of McEwen Health Relationships Week and to celebrate McEwen's new role as the ambassador campus for the Moose Hide Campaign. Uh, as we begin, I'll quickly introduce myself, uh, Curtis Pilon Vinis, Natsiga Asun, Masaskutumanako Chinia. I am a proud Metis Filipino man, and I am, uh, I am currently doing my master's uh, with the Indigenous Land Based Program at uh, the University of Saskatchewan, and also uh, currently a grade nine teacher at Oskayak High School. Uh, so we are going to get into introduction of the rest of our panelists. So uh, we will begin with uh, Kistin. If you'd like to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself. That'd be great. Deadly. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks for starting us off in such a good way. I think I was on mute, wasn't I? We could, I think we could hear you now. Yeah. All right, yeah, so my name is uh, Keystone Odell. I, oh. A lot of network problems here. It's so, Dante uh, Keystone Odell Nitsigasen, Nia Uche Aik Sagahegan. So, my name is Keystone Odell. Um, I'm from originally from Frog Lake First Nation in uh, central eastern Alberta. Uh, I'm a Cree from Treaty Six territory. Um, my dad's of Irish descent, he's from Labrador. Um, so I went to McEwen University. I did a Bachelor of Sociology there and I worked at Keo Austin uh, for about four years there as their Indigenous Student Engagement Advisor um, there. Uh, I presented, I did some research at the university uh, regarding uh, Indigenous women as Halloween costumes, Indigenous masculinities, gender stereotypes, and I presented um, this topic a few times at a few different conferences. And in 2019, I did a TED Talk uh, about this topic as well. Currently, I've I am now living in Calgary, and I am the Indigenous Student Engagement Strategist at the Nikokon Center uh, here at Bow Valley College. And I just really want to thank all our panelists, and I want to thank Kia and Crystal for inviting me uh, to spend just a wonderful day talking about this topic with all of you. Uh, and I, hi, thank you. Awesome, Keeson. Uh, thanks for joining us, and nice to meet you. Uh, next, I'll get Grant to introduce yourself. Yeah, for sure. Tanse Grant Bruno Nasiga Sin, Maskekshik Ekwa Maskwachiza Chinia. Hi, everybody. My name is Grant Bruno. I'm from the communities of Enoch Cree Nation, where I grew up with my mom. And But I'm a registered member of Samson Cree Nation, which is one of the reserves that makes up Maskwachis. I am, and I think the most important role that I kind of occupy is definitely my role as a father. I actually have four children. Um, two of which are actually on the autism spectrum, and I'll get into that just in a second, but I find that me being a father is probably my favorite thing. Um, I wake up, I'm just really grateful that, you know, my children are around, uh, they're such good kids, and I'm really just blessed to have the family that I do. Um, I am a, also a, a PhD student in medical sciences in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. And my research interests are actually around autism in First Nations communities. And so I, I might, a lot of what I do is really close to my heart. Um, but I've been doing research, community-based research, for seven plus years now. And um, one of the studies that I was involved in in Musquitchies was actually going and meeting and engaging with fathers in the community and really trying to explore and allow them to tell stories. And these were uh, considered by the community to be good fathers. Now, these stories are rarely shared, and so I'm really grateful for that, for that you know, experience of me, me being able to connect with these fathers and share their stories in a really healthy way. And it's actually turned into a, a much larger research project called the Deadly Dads, actually, um, which I'm not a part of as a, as a researcher, but more as a, uh, an advisor, which I'm really grateful for. So um, the other thing I do is I, I host a uh, Indigenous a virtual men's Indigenous um, healing circle uh, that's monthly. Um, just because for me, I think connecting with men in a really healthy way, that is a, that's away from, you know, the misogyny that you can find in other circles is, is you know, helped me in my own healing journey. So I'm really grateful to be invited here today. I'm thankful for that, Francis, for the, for the prayer and the song. And, you know, I look forward to the panel. Awesome, Grant. Uh, Lance, would you like to introduce yourself? 
tantsea, tantsea kia, nia, ni tsika atsum, tsina skumabio. Okay, I'm a land scout. My traditional name is uh, Gross Venture Boy. I'm from the uh, Abeitita Peaks. It's the weasel, white weasel tribe, also known as Kainai, the Kainai Nation. Um, I'm a cultural aide with uh, Children's Services, Child and Family Services uh, here in Edmonton. My, um, I guess you'd say my my platform, my venue is, is just what we're going to be talking about today, the masculinities of, of uh, Indigenous men. I uh, desperately and deeply feel passionate to, to help, help our young, our young warriors, our young braves, and our young children to, uh, you know, to, to, to go back and reclaim, you know, Prior to colonization, we were we were a driving force to to survival, and with that survival comes destiny. And I'm hoping to to intrigue or to inspire or to give us some ideals of how you know this whole process, this protocol that will help us to to re reclaim that uh, that creator within and to to start to take, take back, take back our children that are in the system and that are continuing to, you know, to escalate. We're over 70% of Indigenous children. So 70% of our files are Indigenous, Indigenous children that are, are being uh, taken from their, their natural homes their biological homes. So I'm here to, to provide some inspiration and to give some, uh, some culturally, uh, you know, some insight. So thank you for, for having me today. And thank you, Francis, for the prayer and, and the song. It was a really good song. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lance. And last but not least, I'll get Andre to introduce himself. Ogi sego waka te yo kano waka ko mamos to baganak ego ek sei no na na skumuyan ka kisemoin want to thank the elder for the prayer the creator for this day my name is Andre Bear uh Shinia Watske Jusik I come from the land of the white thigh otherwise known as Little Pine I'm also registered in Canoe Lake First Nation I'm a law student and an advocate of inherent and treaty rights um I also uh founded a consulting firm called Indigenous Nation Rebuilding Corporation and I currently uh, do work as a policy uh, analyst for uh, Yorkton Tribal Council and political advisory for the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. Um, most importantly, I wanted to uh, share a little bit about my understanding as well in terms of the roles of men. Um, when I was, before I could walk, I was inducted into the Cowboy Society in Little Pine First Nation. And I'm, I'm, I wanna share a little bit more about uh, what that means. Uh, to our people, it used to be called the Machani Sak, which would be known as the Warrior Society. But um, well, with the Indian Act um, outlawing a lot of our ceremonies, we we uh, turned it into the Cowboy Society, so we wouldn't get um, uh, charged or taken away or disciplined by the Indian agents. So, yeah, just a little bit of history. But uh, thanks for having me. <clears throat> Awesome. Welcome, Andre. Uh, so we are going to begin with our, our first question surrounding the idea and concept of masculinities. And under with the understanding of masculinities, the first question I'm going to ask to you, Grant, is how do you think colonization has impacted our masculinities as Indigenous men? Um, so just using myself as an example, I did not grow up with the culture or the language. I was never really able to immerse myself, my parents, unfortunately. Um, so my mom went to residential school, so did both of my grandmothers, and so the culture was taken away, obviously, through those means, um, but it's also been, you know, taken away in other means, too, you know, the Indian Act, growing up on a reserve, it was a challenge, right? Um, you're basically in survival mode because of colonization, and so you could see over the, like, the last hundred plus years, um, masculinity has been kind of, you know, co-opted by Western kind of views, right? So I grew up thinking, you know, idealizing kind of westernized ideas around masculinity, you know, 
Um, I can see the same thing with, you know, my own family, some of the men in my family, they were the exact same thing, you know, talking about the misogyny, womanizing, you know, mask, you know, you're tough if you drink, things like that. And I was conditioned that way. And unfortunately, and so I find that the, as I've grown and as I've matured over the years, I've really had to unpack that. And the only way that I was able to is through the culture and through ceremony specifically. Um, I do a lot of ceremony now, um, which I'm really grateful for. I was actually just in Little Pine last uh, summer. Uh, I was a part of a chicken dance ceremony where we built the lodge and then we we're able to participate on the second day. And I'm really grateful for these experiences because it's what was missing out of my life for so many years. And I really struggled, right? So I really didn't have a foundation to operate from. Now, my dad was a part of my life. Um, I'm really grateful for him because he was not a womanizer. He was not a misogynist. Um, but we really didn't have very many conversations on masculinity. And so now that I'm learning more about it, I'm really trying to teach my sons too, uh, because I know that with my healing, um, it's going to be less healing for them, but I'm going to have really tough conversations with them as well, you know, on how to respect themselves and how to respect women, how to respect their communities, because unfortunately, these conversations are not happening enough because of Western ideas that men don't talk about their feelings. These Western ideas that men, you know, we, we can't be emotionally available. And so I'm trying to break those down and say that, guess what? There's a much healthier and sustainable approach to what is being a man. And I'm trying to do this with my sons, but I have conversations with friends as well. And I'm really grateful that I have some really good support, you know, friends out there that, that agree with me. And it's, um, it's not easy. It, you know, it can be isolating at times, but it's definitely worth it. Awesome. Yeah, I, I can I can resonate a lot with what you, you shared there. Uh, Keiston, I'll, I'll go directly to you with the same question of, in terms of your experience, how has colonialism impacted your identity? Yeah, so thinking about how colonization directly um, impacted like masculinities, when you think about like, how it very first started is that they introduced notions of like Western masculinity things like property or capital gains or uh, things like that. And then also, um, so set that up as a standard of that's what masculine is, but also take away the ability to reach those, um, those achievements as well, right? So we can see like, um, like with the Indian Act, with the removal of, uh, you know, indigenous people not being able to sell agriculture, right? So or have things like that. And so we have this Western notion saying, this is what it's like to be a man, be this man, but also taking away any ability to reach that standard. So it's kind of like this lost gain. And at the same time, when you look at notions of the Indian Act and the things happening in there is that they took away things like being able to have ceremony, being able to have men's group, being able to have regalia, um, and then saying, well, this is what it's like to be an indigenous man. And so with colonization, it's that destruction of culture. And then somehow they're able to turn it around and try to give it back to us and say, this is what you're like, this, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to aspire. Um, and so if we don't have those systems of how to live up to that masculinity or achieve that masculinity, we, sometimes we end up looking at those colonized views of uh, masculinity. An example I like to use is like smoke signals when uh, Thomas and Victor are on the bus and he's like, don't you know how to be a real Indian? And then he's like, uh, you got to take your braids out or you uh, do you want to be dances with salmon? And so if you look at uh, Victor, uh, because of that destruction of his own culture, what is he looking at? He's looking at only the Western view or that colonized view of culture is that the only way to be a man is to hunt the buffalo or is to uh, let your hair down and not have it in braids and stuff like that. But in reality, is masculinity in his culture is perhaps fishing. It is, you know, it doesn't have to be one size fit all masculinity for everybody. Um, and so that's where that colonization kind of comes in, right? Is that we look at other people's notions of it. And the one thing with colonization when it comes to Indigenous identity, it always seems like non-Indigenous people, Canadian governments or Western views can feel like they can take that away from Indigenous people too. And it'd be like, you're not Indigenous enough or you're not man enough or these kind of things there. Um, and like, I've heard it, I used to work in the oil field all the time and people would say things like, oh, I'm going to take away your man card because, you know, you, I don't know, you went to dance class or something like that, right? But at the same thing too, uh, as Indigenous men, we have this dual part where people think that they can take away that masculinity if we don't subscribe to it, but they also think they can take away that indigeneity as well, that you're not being enough. And so it's this dual parted part there. So I guess it's 
how do we, how are we navigating the the healthy stories or the healthy parts of our identity? Well, like, sorry, that's that's kind of where I'm at there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. And uh, I'm gonna come to you here, Andre. And we're hearing a lot of the challenges and the current state of the masculine identities within our communities. Um, and, I, and I feel even just within in my circles, my experience of, of that starting to recognize these things, recognize these discrepancies. But to you, Andre, and if you're able to speak to this, what is the, the, the old ways? What, what are the, the masculine ways that we viewed as indigenous peoples before even colonialism? I think that'd be a good place to start unpacking because our young people are starting to recognize that's not us and these things aren't healthy but what is the alternative due to the disruption of colonization? Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, a, lot, a lot of the comprehension, the Neheo Mamta Nichigan, that way of thinking, um, it wouldn't be looked at as a good thing today. It wouldn't be looked at as something that's politically correct because as men, our only purpose in the world, the only reason why you are alive is to provide and protect women and children. That's it. If, you, if you're not doing that, you have no purpose as a Nehio man. And so, of course, there's, this, this, there's um, intersections with two-spirit people, and that's another conversation. But specifically for the role of a man, of a warrior, Okijitao, that means that your job is to provide for women and children. And so... Um, it changed drastically when we began hitting our women, when we began hitting our kids, because a lot of the times we don't take care of our own kids as men anymore. The province is looking after our kids through the child welfare system. So colonization has entirely eradicated our traditional familial concepts of how we get along, how we relate to each other, how we relate to the world. And um, how I can describe that in a more simple way is that uh, the old way of living was natural and it was in tune with nature. And it was similar to how um, animals and the environment um, relates with each other. And that's how we lived our lives too. And so that was the purpose of, of being a man was to, pr to provide and protect for women and children. And, and you see today, all of our men are locked up in prisons, right? And um, to me, it's because that, that, that family structure was eradicated. Um, today, we don't treat our women with respect. We have no respect for our women. We don't know how to look after our own kids. And it's not until we truly um, go back to that Nehio Mom to Nietzsche gun. And, and that, the only way you can get there is through our ceremonies. And the more you go to our ceremonies, the more that, um, that spirit hopefully will awaken inside you and you can um, come to understand your real purpose as a human being, as a man, and um, how to... Um, support creation uh, and not um, fight against it. Thank you for that, that answer, Andre. Um, Lance, uh, I'll come to you next here in kind of continuing on this conversation of the impacts of colonialism to then these old ways and how do we kind of piece this together and, and find that healing obviously through ceremonies in your own experience. Um, what has your journey been within your own masculinity and, and the impacts of colonization to and all these policies and whatnot? I'd just like to uh, respond to, you know, the, the definition of masculinity in the Western worldview is to be handsome, to be muscled, and to be driven. You know, in the indigenous worldview, you know, it's opposite. There's three, it's a trinity of prayer, a man to be committed to know how to pray is very crucial in our indigenous worldview. And in my worldview, to pray is, is what you just heard from Francis, to pray in your language. The second one is to sing, just what we started with, the song, to sing your power song takes a great deal of commitment and humility. It also provides the energies, the sensitivities, the, you know, that whole courage of that we're gonna be okay. 
despite the odds against us, we're going to be okay. When you hear that power song, when somebody sings you a song, there you go. The last one is, is the whole purpose of dance. That's the real, real masculinity. You look at the peacock, you look at the raven, the crow, you look at the prairie chicken, you look at the musqua. How do they get their meat? They don't get them for free. They got to dance their heart out. And they've got to give, give everything that they have. Because I believe in indigenous man, our, our purpose is to learn how to celebrate death. And once we know how to celebrate death, then life begins. It's like in when we're hunters, we've got to go through a transfer, a sweat lodge, whatever ceremony that your nation offers you to understand the celebration of death, the ultimate sacrifice. And when we dance, we dress up. Some of us don't wear shirts. We wear a breastplate. We have a, a knife. We have what we sat and built and carved to understand that we could be taken by the Musqua if we're hunting Musqua. So being prepared to say, well, you know, I'm going to live this day like it's my last. Because what I do today is going to be, is going to be tomorrow. That's how I'm going to be tomorrow. So that's what I've learned through, through my life, my teachings. And uh, again, thank you. I take, take, that, that is my, my, my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Lance. Um, with all the panelists in this first round of questions, we hear the themes of within colonialism of things like patriarchy and how patriarchy has ingrained itself within our systems. And you see that reflected in even some of our own political systems with male as the leaders were, were traditionally a matriarchal system where our women are, are the center for those leaders. Um, I'll go to you, Grant, here in the, the second question I'll ask. And when I saw this on the, the notes for questions that I asked people, I was, the first thing I thought of was a scene of Res Dogs, Reservation Dogs, where Dallas Goldsmith came and said, hey, young warrior. And the question is, you know, what is it, what does it mean to you to be a warrior today uh, in today's society? Uh, so I'll start with you, Grant. He does it like a mean segue, right? I was going to do one, but I, you know, I didn't want to scare anybody. <laughs> um, so there's always that old saying, like a warrior carries the burden of peace, right? And so what that really means to me is that, um, so, you know, we're very conditioned to, uh, to, you know, to be violent, to be aggressive, to be, uh, you know, this person that, you know, has to go out and kind of influence things in a very negative, unhealthy way. And that totally is, goes against, you know, the tradition of what it means to be masculine, right? So I've learned, again, I'm going to go back to what I've learned in ceremony. Um, so we, we, we know we do sweat lodges. Um, I believe the Cree word for sweat lodge is metutsin, if I'm not, if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. But it translates as crying lodge, actually. So one of the, one of, I went to my first sweat lodge when I believe it was like 21. And this was the first time I've seen grown men cry. Right. And to me, that's warrior right there, like allowing yourself to have the courage to show your emotions in front of other men in a really healthy way. And for me, that's probably one of the most important things is that level of vulnerability. Like, are you being who you are? Like, are you able to connect with people on a much deeper level than just being this like stone cold, cold person that doesn't understand their own emotions? Are you willing to uh, connect in a much healthier way than what you've learned? Are you willing to self-reflect in a way that's critical, but still gentle? And that's another thing I've learned as a father is I've had to be really gentle because my children, they don't need somebody putting the law down physically or verbally or anything like that. 
And over the years, I've learned how to be gentle with myself, which is new as well, because I know that I'm my own worst enemy. I have all sorts of trauma that I've had to unpack. And that's just me being honest. Um, unfortunately, with that trauma, I've hurt other people. And so there's another level that I think for the modern warrior is accountability, right? So we often talk about, okay, you got to not only apologize, you got to hold yourself accountable to that act, to your actions. And that apology has to have uh, changed behavior within it. Because to me, apologies mean nothing unless there's actual steps behind it that are going to make you better. You're going to learn from it. Because if you're just perpetuating the same things over and over as men, you're you're contributing, you're a part of the problem and you're not a part of the solution, unfortunately. And so the challenge for me always is, is like, am I doing things in a really healthy way that, you know, align with my values? Or am I still in that old way of thinking that's going to, you know, hurt people and myself? Thank you for, for, for sharing your answer. I could definitely re relate to that in, this, in the sense of, we get within those realms of patriarchy. We, we have to act tough. We have to be strong. We can't show emotion. And in that, we suppress our own true emotions. And in that suppression and in that pain, then we end up hurting other people. And, and I can just, as, as you said too, for, my, for myself, I know I have been that person. And to recognize those things, to acknowledge them, and then to take that step of, like you were saying, accountability, and then making that change, recognizing those wrongs, it is so important to what being a warrior is, especially as, as, as we heal, as our communities heal. Uh, Keiston, I'll, I'll come to you. What, it, what does it mean to, uh, to be a warrior to you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's this book, 100 Days of Cree by uh, Neil McLeod, I think is the author. And in there, he has this definition, Okisatao, um, saying it means like we're the young person, but it's also meaning like a provider or a provider of people. And then he was talking about how uh, in the olden days when the warriors would go out and hunt, that they would have to serve everyone first and uh, they would eat last. And if they didn't get enough for everybody, um, then they wouldn't eat, right? So the thought was always to think of community beforehand. And so I really thought about that idea of, in like Western way, we think of like warrior as like that very rough, gruff, I always use like Achilles from like Troy, like for the glory and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when I think about it as a, as a Cree man, uh, an Ogisatao is a provider and a provider um, isn't just a, like a breadwinner or somebody who makes things happen but a provider is a provider of their gifts. What makes someone powerful is their ability to make things happen. And everybody has that ability to make things happen. Um, we're all born in with inherent gifts um, right away. We all have the gift of compassion, of kindness, of honesty, of silence, of showing up. My mission would tell me that the greatest gift that you have is your time, just generally showing up. And so being a warrior is understanding what the community needs and then providing for that. And so the idea of what a warrior is, its definition, I think changes with the situation or the community or the task at hand. Um, sometimes what the community may need from a warrior is kindness to others. Um, sometimes being a warrior, just showing up when you don't wanna show up, right? Sometimes being a warrior is uh, being kind when you just don't have the capacity to be kind to that person, right? Uh, being a warrior is talking to other men or uh, being vulnerable. That's what I idea of what being a modern indigenous warrior is. So if I think about our communities right now uh, being affected by COVID or being affected by government policies or uh, toxic masculinity, what's needed by men right now um, is to listen, it seems like, right? It's, it's to listen to the people who are being marginalized. It's to listen to the people who are disadvantaged. Uh, it's to show up for those people. It's to not speak on their behalf, but ensure that they have a voice as well. Um, so that's what kind of the idea of what a warrior means to me now. And the thing is that because we're all born with these inherent gifts of kindness, of laughter, of compassion, is that anybody has the capacity to be a warrior, right? Um, and that it's a lifelong journey there as well. Um, and then again, I always think of my Wisham, uh, what you uh, talked about earlier, Grant, in terms of like the sweat lodge, it reminds me of my Wisham as well. Um, and I can talk about stuff, but I always remember is when I was a kid, it was that I had men in my life who gave me the ability to talk and not only to talk, but to be heard and listened to from a young age. So at a young age, I had all these other older men who allowed me to speak 
and allowed me to be heard and allowed me to be listened. And I think it's up to me as I get older and the rest of us to ensure that we're given those same opportunities to people in our communities who need that opportunity to be heard and listened to. Definitely, thank you, Kisin. Uh, Andre, uh, what does it mean to be a warrior to you? Um, so I'll talk about the Cowboy Society. So again, the name changed. Um, it used to be the Majani Suck, and there's still a Majani Suck Society in Poundmaker. I guess they weren't scared of their Indian agent, but the Little Pine was. But um, anyways, um, so there's these societies, and um, a lot of this information comes from Eric Tusis, Colby, and Mylan. Um, but there used to be uh, these warrior societies, uh, and they were not afraid of death like at all. Um, there's the Battle of Cut Knife, Knife Hill, and we're told stories. I was told stories when I was younger that um, little kids, like 14 years old, were running across like the gunfire and they were laughing. And so those are the stories about um, our actual, our real warriors that were, um, uh, you had to be born and, and, and um, earn your right into that society uh, by having no fear and by uh, providing um, everything that you have uh, to the people and putting yourself last. And so the, the story goes that after the Battle of Cut Knife Hill, they all went to the mountains. The warrior society was no longer going to be needed because treaties were going to be signed and that it was supposed to bring peace and that um, these societies were no longer going to um, serve much of a purpose. And so they went onto a mountain um, somewhere in British Columbia, and uh, that was the last time they were ever seen. But uh, the principles of the society were um, reintroduced into uh, our nations through the Cowboy Society, the Machane Sek. And their uh, sole job on the reserve is to um, be there for every single funeral, every feast, every sun dance, every single ceremony that we have. Um, the Warrior Society is supposed to be there and um, providing um, all of the work, do, cutting all of the wood and doing everything that needs to be done for the community. And so I think um, I think back to what my Muslim uh, told me, um, I think he just he said it not long ago, but uh, we we're in a ceremony and there was little kids that are probably like uh, eight, nine years old and they were serving soup and stuff at a feast. And um, he said, um, look, he said they're they're learning how to serve. They're being servants of the creator. He said um, they're when you do that they're not taking, they're not just take, 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 they're, they're serving instead, they're giving. And he said, um, the, the more you do that, the less you're going to see um, women mistreated and children mistreated by men. So yeah, that's what I gotta say. Thank you for sharing that, Andre. Uh, Lance, I'll come to you to finish off this question. What is it to be a warrior new in today's society? What it is to be a warrior is commitment. Um, I've been to sun dances, you know, recently in the past three years. And the elders have come to me and they asked me, what can we do to bring our, our warriors back? And commitment. And they all shook their head. They said, yes. Now you know what to do, Lance. You know what to do is to restore that commitment, that compassionate commitment to healing. So taking that initiative and that commitment to heal, because in my work, it's very difficult. There's a lot of trauma in our warriors today. They're all warriors. They never lost that warrior instinct. It's in the blood. Robbie Robertson spoke a lot about it. The Native Americans. To really understand that commitment we have to, to Umstabad, the Peel, the source of life. To go back and eat. Eat the buffalo, they're coming home. They're sacrificing themselves to come back. They're re-sacrificing themselves for us to eat, to eat well, to eat good. So a warrior has to be committed because we've got to change this marginalized society. We've got to protect our, our indigenous women 
our indigenous girls, our daughters of tradition. So it's that belief and that faith and to take that leap the way the Buffalo are doing it today. Let's do it, warriors. We can do this. Done. Hey. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, we will be going to uh, the next question here. I uh, want to just keep things moving. Thank you so much for what has been shared so far. Um, but the next question is, what does inclusion and respect look like for LGBTQ, two-spirit men and non-binary folks as we look at the gender on a continuum rather than a col colonial binary? Um, so I'll begin with you, Grant. Yeah, so one thing I've learned about the, the Cree or the Nahialan language is that it's not gendered, right? It's animate, inanimate. And one thing that language does is it really builds the foundation for your culture. And so one thing I've learned is that our cultures are very egalitarian, right? Very inclusive. And the other thing I've learned about, you know, even like ceremony is that ceremonies are very inclusive, right? And they should be. Um, I was taught that once you hear about a ceremony, you don't even invite, once you hear about it, that's your invite. And then how inclusive is that, right? And so it's really trying to take what I've learned here and then try and apply it to my daily life. And one thing that I try and do is I, I don't think it's enough to be non-homophobic anymore. You have to be anti-homophobic. You have to start challenging your friends, your family, you know, that locker room talk where you use, you know, certain words as pejorative or very negative or as a put down. You got to start calling people out, right? And it's going to be uncomfortable, but that's where the growth is, is within that discomfort. And so if you want, and we should make, be trying to make all of our communities as inclusive as they can to all, everybody, right? So I work a lot, even in disabilities and our, our communities are not inclusive to disabilities. And it's that exact same process. You know, we have this idea that's very negative, you know, uh, our negative biases towards a certain group. And that comes out in our behaviors and our decision-making and how we interact. So it's, it's, a, it's a process of, you know, being really self-reflexive and really thinking about your own belief systems and your own knowledges, and then using an action-based kind of approach to making sure that you're like, living what you're saying as well. Mm -hmm. No, that, that is definitely true, especially I know growing up um, in, in Saskatoon uh, and being around sports and, and unfortunately some of the, the locker room talk or even at school, uh, just things of homophobic language still being used. And, you know, I, I do hear it sometimes at school as well or at where I work and it, it's helping students recognize, you know, why you can't use that language and, and don't use that language. And then obviously the history of where that comes from. Uh, Keystone, I'll come to you. So what does inclusion respect look like for the LGBTQ two-spirit men and non-binary folks to you? Yeah, for sure. Well, when we are talking about uh, what it means to be a Gisetau, um, and that idea of provider, um, that's pretty universal, right? It's providing for community and not exclusionary, right? And I think when we create groups as a people, we tend to be like exclusionary or inclusionary. So we're a group because we exclude this person or we're a group because we include these people. I think as warriors that we need to make sure that we're always being inclusive rather than being exclusive, right? So you're a warrior because A, B, or C, uh, if you don't fit that criteria, you can't be. But instead, we are existing as warriors saying that this uh, identity is open for everybody there, right? Um, so actually, I, I asked this question once before about how I can be a better ally uh, as someone doing this. And um, I had this person tell me that it was to ensure I just create a safe space. Um, and they just let me know that hey, even just having a, uh, a pride flag in your office or at the place of your work can bring a sense of comfort for uh, LGBTQ2S+. Um, so I started here at the Indigenous Center, uh, an EcoCon Center here in Calgary. And one of the first things we did right away was uh, get a pride flag, the Two-Spirit pride flag here. Um, so it's actually gonna arrive on Friday and then we have Two-Spirit teachings here uh, next week as well. Um, and the same thing, I know Kiowasin has the pride uh, prints all around there um, to ensure that uh, everybody is represented. But again, I think, and it's the same thing Grant had to say uh, in rural Alberta and oil field area, a lot of homophobic language uh, happening a lot of times. So having those conversations with your family or with your family members, right? So, or your friends, um, 
you know, if my cousin says something derogatory, I need, I need to be the one who steps in and says, hey, like, shut up. Like, you need to be better. You need to be kinder. You need to be nicer. Uh, and they may get mad. They may not. But I think as warriors, that's the position we have to stand for, right? Is that we have to say what is right and what is wrong and have the hard conversations if we want to be warriors too or be for providers for the community. Uh, thank you. Definitely. And even thinking back, it definitely ties into the first question we asked regarding how has colonization impact our identities, our masculinities. This is obviously evidence of, you know, within, especially within residential schools and how uh, religion was used and the identity, identity within Christianity of that male is this and, and, and that, and that anything, anything within the LGBT community is wrong. And obviously that went polar opposite against our traditional beliefs. Um, Andre, I'll ask you, you know, how do we, how do you feel we can be respectful and inclusive to the LGBTQ two-spirit community? Well, as your token two-spirit of the panel, this better be good. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, um, there's a, a law that we have. Um, it's a principle, but it's Kise Watswin. And so it's kindness and, um, uh, people think of it like oh just be kind be happy but there's more to it when you look at it through a spiritual lens um, there's this kindness that the creator has for all of his children and that's the kind of kindness that you're supposed to have too and the spirits tell us that you'll never go broke on kindness like you'll always have more and more and more of it the more you use it and so it's this special gift that we have and um, a lot of people in our circles our ceremonies a lot of medicine people, a lot of elders, they lack that important law, and you'll know by how they talk to people, you'll know by how they treat people, that you'll know how they make you feel. And so spiritually, when we have these fundamental laws uh, to go back on, like you say, and in treating people with kindness, that should be the number one law uh, from the creator. And you look at people, elders or teachers, or um, and and they they're not following that, or you don't feel that from them. Um, I think that's when we know uh, to stay away from those spaces. And so when uh, I think whether or not somebody's two spirit, trans, lesbian, gay, bi, um, if that elder or that person um, in that space has that Gise Watsu and it's not going to matter who that other person's sleeping with or how they're presenting their gender. It's just ridiculous to think that way. Why it's, it's wrong that we think that way, but a lot of elders do. They, it matters to them who they're, who they're teaching, uh, who they're going to be sleeping with. It matters that if they're gay, if they're lesbian, and that's wrong. It's really messed up, actually. And it just goes to show how lost we can be uh, in our ceremonies. So it goes back to returning to those fundamental laws and um, uh, being real about it, not being fake or phony. And so, um, uh, uh, and also remembering that a lot of um, uh, our elders and medicine people have been um, uh, harmed uh, in residential schools there's so much pedophilia. I was working for a law firm uh, two summers ago. I read about 100 files and you wouldn't believe the amount of sexual abuse. Every single file I've, I've ever read um, in Indian residential schools was sexual abuse and it was often uh, male, male, female, female. And so um, a lot of the older generations through colonization and, and, the, and the, the, um, the darkness of it uh, unfortunately, they have these um, internalized beliefs of homophobia, and they'll um, project that onto everyone around them. And so I've, I've faced it before, too, in ceremonies where people say ignorant stuff. But um, sometimes I, I, I just like to make fun of them, like, you're gay, too. Like, <laughs> and probably somewhere along the way, I, I know you, you probably... Um, uh, like experimented or something. So I don't know. I just like to, to stay, uh, keep kindness and to um, try to see that in other people. And as long as you stick to that, like that inclusion will just come. People will feel comfortable around you. They'll know that it's right to be around that person. And if they don't have that, then I would just beware and go find a different place. Thank you for sharing uh, your story and your experience, Andre. Uh, Lance, uh, 
I'll, I'll end off with you for this question. How do we be respectful and pro provide opportunities of inclusion for LGBTQ and two-spirit people? I really like what you said, Andre. You know, our elders, our ancestors have spoken that it takes seven generations, you know, to alter a paradigm within human nature with the human spirit. So it's the education. It's like the circle, what comes around goes around. You know, if you're biased, if you're prejudiced, if you're homophobic, it's gonna come around and it's gonna really, and that's what the warrior is about, is that humility. And a lot of us lose that humility because we're reacting to these prejudices, these biases. In ceremony, you know, I've been to a lot of ceremonies, you know, and that's the teachings that we're, we're told in our societies. The whole significance of the center pole is based on that little boy and that little girl. And the whole process of, of what genuine medicine for any one of us, male or female, is love. It's like celebrating death in order to, to live. So celebrating that feminine inside of you, aligning it the way the center pole comes down and roots itself to Mother Earth. There's no denying our creation stories are built. We are people of the land across Turtle Island. So we're all seeking that, that love. And I believe the traumas that, and the colonization had ignited a separation but you look, you listen to the old stories of the Sundance, you're gonna see how everything aligns, the way we rotate. It's the same way with masculinity and femininity. An elder that has to run a ceremony has to have that emotional intelligence, that emotional maturity to accept all that is in, in the circle. So having that ultimate respect and in the seven teachings, that respect is the buffalo. And the buffalo is, is our source of life. So if we could learn to feed off this duality and that's what we're moving into. We're moving into the eighth fire. We're starting to understand there's that reunification of mind, body, spirit, and emotions. You know, I've worked with a lot of, throughout my career, throughout all my ceremonial life, I've worked with, with gay, with two-spirited, lesbian, and it's, it's part of being that masculinity is to accept, accept the things, you know, that are in front of you, because whatever you do, there's a reaction. And again, that's what I, I find. I, I love and I support. There's a movie, I encourage you, if you haven't seen it already, Jack Bell or Joe Bell. In 2013, he was doing a walk across America because his son had committed suicide because of being bullied for his, his gender. He was, he was bullied, he was raped. And he had this denial. So he sacrificed himself. 
and ended up on October 6, 2013. He got run over from a trucker that fell asleep and ran him over. But the moral of the story was that he loved his son so deeply and he missed his son and he was trying to rid his, what he didn't do, what he could have, should have did when his son approached him to let him know that the football team had beaten and raped him. So what did he do? He just walked. He made it from Oregon all the way to Colorado. That's almost halfway. He didn't quite make halfways across America. Then he was taken. But I encourage you, it's a true story. It's in our time right now. So what you just said, Andre, let's keep doing this. Let's keep talking. Let's keep educating ourselves and be understanding that our elders had spoken. It's going to take not only your grandchildren, their children. Let's hope that we could live holistically and lovingly despite our choice of, 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 of our gender. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing sharing that. Uh, this is definitely an important topic that continues needs to be talked about, uh, continues to be, needs to be, you know, when there is homophobic language challenged uh, and obviously that education piece and, you know, remembering who we are and, and the Nehel Mamtanichigan, what Andre was mentioning earlier, that Nehel or Cree old way of thinking and how we're supposed to relate to one another. Uh, in, the, in the last time that we have here, we're going to focus on uh, we're going to focus on Mio Matsito and, and Mio Wachito and uh, just health, good health and, and getting along and living in harmony with one another. Uh, and under that theme, uh, I'm going to ask the panelists just with, with time, uh, the time restraints. Uh, if there's, I'm going to read the questions here. And if there's one that you specifically want to speak to, uh, just, just let me know. So I will go through them right now. Uh, one question is, how does violence against Indigenous women and girls, and I would also add LGBTQ and Two-Spirit peoples, impact Indigenous men and communities? Uh, second question, what are some red flags and green flags for healthy Indigenous intimate partner relationships? Uh, question three, how do healthy and positive relationships between Indigenous men uh, an example, being a loving father, an uncle, an older brother, a mentor to younger men, promote healthy masculinities and healing. And then finally, what advice would you give to Indigenous men out there who are struggling with their mental health, their identity, their uh, self-esteem, or addictions? So I'll, I'll kind of open the floor here. And so if there's a, a topic there that any of you gentlemen would like to, to tackle by any means, uh, go for it. Yeah, so I think, you know, for the men that are struggling, I think that's one's really important to me because there's so many men that are struggling, right? They're struggling with uh, their own experiences. They're struggling with their own identities. They're struggling with, you know, where to go next, essentially. And so one thing that I'm really mindful of is in our communities, we have to have these tough conversations around violence to women. Us as Indigenous men, we're the one who, perpetu who perpetuate violence against women. We are. And we, it's not some far off boogeyman coming into our communities. It's us. And that's a harsh truth. And that's something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And we are not even having these conversations yet because we're so ashamed that, you know, these, you know, mainstream Canadians are going to judge us. But if we don't talk about it, we can't heal from it. You know, we, can, we you have to have more conversations about the sexual violence that happens in our communities. I'm a survivor of, of sexual violence. I'm okay with talking about that now. But for a lot of years, I it was shameful. I couldn't talk about it. I'd start shaking. And I'm, I've talked about it at length, though. I've went out. And to the men that are struggling, you have to reach out for help. You can't do it on your own. I tried. I was that lone wolf who just Oh, I'll figure it out. No, I have a strong support system. I do therapy. I go to ceremony. I do more. I put more time and effort into my mental, spiritual, physical, and psychological health than I do my PhD. And it's a lot. 
because I have to maintain that and I have to manage it. And so it's okay. So go out, offer tobacco for your ceremony name. Like my traditional name is Osao Tim, it's Yellow Horse. And that has impacted my life in a really good way. Um, and then the last thing, I guess, is this idea around, you know, we're very much crabs in a bucket. You know, we're often pulling each other down. And this is a very toxic way. And I understand it's all the result of colonialism, but it's up to us to heal from it. Like you can use every excuse in the book, you know, I'm colonized, I don't, you know, I've, I've had violence perpetuated against me. They're all there, but at the other side of it is like accountability for your own healing because you're responsible for yourself. Definitely. Uh, keep I think my bad. Oh, yeah. That muted myself there. Um, but yeah, Keystone, if there is a within that last topic of healthy health and wellness, if there's a top issue there that you'd like to touch on. For sure. Yeah. When we we're talking about that violence against Indigenous women and girls and how it impacts, uh, pretty much what Grant had to say, right, in terms of that we're not talking about it, we're having these tough conversations. Um, there's this book I've been reading, it's called Indifferent Indifference. Uh, it's about violence and missing and murdered Indigenous women. And it was that uh, Canadian society is generally indifferent to violence that Indigenous women face. Um, like there's not a lot of outrage when it happens or uh, people don't want to talk about it. Um, so we need to have these conversations and we not, need to not be indifferent towards um, what is happening to women. An example, when I was a teenager, when I was 16, um, I met my wife. Um, and one of the, I told one of my cousins that, you know, I'm like, oh my God, like, she's amazing. I can't wait to wife her one day, which I did. But at the time he made a, uh, a joke and he's like, native chicks are blah, blah, blah. I won't repeat it, but it was really offensive. And I didn't say anything. I just laughed. And then, uh, that was it. But then a year later I moved to town. So I was going to a white school and then, uh, these new friends I made who are not indigenous said something really sexist and racist about, Indigenous woman. And I tried to fight him and I got really mad about it. And I was telling people about it. But I was thinking, I was like, man, I was ready to fight and get in the face of this um, non Indigenous guy for saying something really sexist about Indigenous woman. But I wasn't willing to have that fight with my own cousins or with my own family or my own friends. Why is that? I need to make sure I stand up and I need to make sure that I'm having these conversations um, with these men because they're having it as well. And when we talk about Indigenous communities as well, is that we, it's not so much a lot of toxic masculinity, but sometimes there's a lack of masculinity in families or masculine figures there. And so when we are okay with this violence against Indigenous women, um, I mean, why would they want to be around us as well, right? It's the one thing. Uh, why would they want us in our ceremonies or our communities if we're not standing up for them, if we're not being leaders in them? Um, last year, I went to a Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's uh, Walk. There was no woman speakers. I don't know who organized the event, but it was all men. And it was it's kind of a weird thing to see, right? And so making sure that they're being heard and that we're understanding uh, what they need to heal as well and how we can assist them in that area. Um, to Indigenous men who are struggling with mental health identity and addictions, I'd say is finding strength within ourselves as well and what we know and what we don't know as well, right? That it's a lifelong journey. Um, and the positive relationships with other men, I think not setting the standard of what is like peak masculinity, right? Uh, my dad's like a military oil field, like rough and tough kind of guy. Um, and he came to like my poetry reading because he's like, that's cool. I want to support my son, but he could be uh, that hyper masculine instead, right? So I think it's meeting men where, where they're at and meeting men where they want to be and where they want to be in the future as well. Um, too often do we talk about Indigenous men as a deficit, as in Indigenous men don't, or they haven't, or this or this, but how can we start talking about Indigenous men do do these things, or we can start doing these things, or how are we bringing them into this conversation? Um, green flags, I always say, uh, when you're in a relationship with somebody um, and you're arguing, it's you two versus the problem, rather than you versus each other. So I think that's, that's what I always have to say in green flags, is if you're attacking the problem, as a couple, uh, and, and like us as men here sitting at this panel, we're attacking these issues or as a team uh, rather than each other, right? So I think that's where that healthy masculinity part comes in. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, Andre? <clears throat> I think uh, 
there's no way around it. I think Indigenous men, uh, Nehio men, need to come back to our ceremonies. And I, I don't see it any other way uh, for them to decolonize or to um, become better. Um, maybe if they worked with animals in some way, worked with horses or like spent time on the land, they'd have a way of reconnecting. But other than that, I, 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 I think ceremonies are the only way for uh, Nehio men, Indigenous men to, um, to uh, become better people. And I think that uh, a lot of this conversation uh, needs to be taken where uh, Indigenous men are, like in prisons and jails. And um, that's where a lot of our, our men or our warriors we talk about, that's where they're at. And um, personally, I don't know if I'd be one of those. I, I think I'd be more of a, a, like a berry picker, like they'd say. <laughs> I wouldn't be a deadly hunter. But um, I think those, these kinds of conversations need to be brought to, to men that, that really need to hear it. And until we're, we're able to do that, I, I don't know, I don't see too much changing in our communities because um, it's nice to have these conversations on a small scale and this is where it starts, right? But I think systemic change is needed in the areas of, um, of government policy and how indigenous men are targeted and, and imprisoned in Canadian systems, um, how indigenous women are, are targeted um, through the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women uh, and Girls Final Report Inquiry and, um, how our children are targeted in the child welfare systems. And so I think it's all interconnected into a web of colonialism. And I think that um, the only way we can stop it is by returning to our ceremonies and um, remembering who we are as Nehiwak, returning to that Nehiwak Mamtanichika and that old way of thinking and Kisei Watts when practicing um, the creator's laws and, and how we live and how we treat other people. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Lance? I just wanted to, uh, to reflect. I was thinking a lot about this question. I was reading the questions and uh, I found a quote and that's what I'll, I'll uh, respond with this question is, uh, I just wanna read you this quote. It's by Brooke Medicine Eagle. So it's by one of our daughters. It says here, being ind indigenous, being indigenous is an attitude a state of mind, a way of being in harmony with all things and all beings. It is allowing the heart to be the distributor of energy on this planet, to allow feelings and sensitivities to determine where energy goes, bringing aliveness up from the earth and from the sky, putting it in and giving it out from the heart. I just, it speaks for itself. You know, it's just positive. And one thing, one red flag is, is the addictions. Heal your addictions. Find ways to treat. A man alone is only half the man. A man that's addicted is only half the man. For some would say it's, it's not being a man, but I believe the addictions need to stop. Thank you. Definitely, in, in everything that was just said by our, our panelists, you, you can hear the correlation of, of healing and, and what does healing look like? Uh, and Andre said it within the systemic, there's systemic outcomes that are happening to our community because of colonization. So I, just to close this, and then we get into the Q&A here from, from the audience is how do we disrupt that? And, you know, I personally believe they'll be going back to, to our ceremonies, to going back to learning from the land, to learning from one another. Uh, it wasn't really mentioned and maybe some of you have this experience as well, but I grew up in a single parent home with just my mom and never had a, a father figure in my life. And so then as a young person growing up in the urban center, I looked at media, I looked at entertainment, I looked at sports and you know, that's all hyper masculinity and I gotta have this. And as I look back within my journey of, of healing and, and still healing, recognizing these patterns and, and even when you talk with about addictions there of recognizing these patterns of addictions um, from, and then how not only they, they are ultimately hurting yourself 
but then hurting other people. And then it, it is a journey of recognizing it and then moving forward through that accountability, through growing in growth. So to those that can relate to, to that aspect as well, just know that you're also not alone in that there, 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 there's a place for you at these ceremonies that, that a lot of other panelists talked about. And I know that it's something that has definitely changed my life. Um, to close, we are going to do some Q&A. So I'm just going to take a look at our, our questions here. Um, and if you do have Q&A here, please uh, send some questions in the chat there and I'll do my best to, to read them. Um, oh, now there's a bunch coming in. And, okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. What is the, what is the importance of health, diet, and activity? and activity in the context of being an Indigenous warrior, being responsible to our own well-being. Does anybody want to tackle that question? I would just say very quickly, I think it's important to show leadership in, um, in, in eating a healthy diet and trying to eat as, as, as well as you can. I think diabetes, heart disease, and um, being overweight is... Um, like really, really harmed our communities. Like a lot of our children are going to be sick, like even today, because we still haven't learned how to um, feed ourselves um, in, a, in a healthy way. Um, and so I think being a warrior would, would, would be uh, being a leader and trying to eat healthier and um, stay away from smoking and drinking and all that stuff and, and teach that to your kids. I think one is really getting rid of those ideas of what masculine eating is, right? So we're going to eat fast food because I'm so manly. I got to go drink beer and have wings on the weekend. You know, for lunch, all I had was a, was a salad. And I'm okay with that. Like, I am totally comfortable eating a salad. It doesn't make me less of a man. <laughs> and, you know, the physical thing, right? Like, I, I go for walks. I, you know, do as many things as I can, right? I just try and get outside more. And that's so important for for all the very spiritual, physical, and mental, and psychological health. And it's really taking like a physical is just one quad quadrant, right? You got to be able to kind of touch on each every single day, even if it's just a little bit. Like you don't have to, you know, go change all of your habits right away, but just do a little bit. Go eat, go, you know, one thing I've learned about even grocery shopping is stick to the outside, right? That's where all the fresh food is. And then all those inner lanes and aisles are just the processed stuff. So little things like that have helped me with my own, my own health. Definitely, and it also goes back to with addictions and food. That's another thing that people don't usually look at food as an addiction, but it definitely is something that it, it is impacting our community. Kistin, did you have something that you wanted to add to the conversation? Oh yeah, I, it was what uh, Grant had to say too about like, uh, there's such a bro culture around like food, uh, like, you know, big greasy burgers and stuff like that too. And again, there with the, um, with the medicine wheel too, right? Taking care of the emotional, physical, mental, spiritual part there um, so that you don't become unbalanced. I quit smoking like two weeks ago um, and I needed to catch the train today and I wasn't winded when I like <laughs> ran to the train. So the, and I was able to make work on time, right? So I think it's the little things uh, in there as well. Um, I think it was James McCocus who said, um, the first thing that Crees were really good at doing was running. Um, and so I think he's training for like a hundred kilometer like marathon right now or something like that. Um, and I just think that's super cool in terms of being healthy, right? So yeah. Hmm. Uh, I got a, a great question here. Where did it go there? Uh, I got a question here is what do you think the most important things are that young men can learn from their mothers? Uh, and it says asking as the independent mom of a male identifying youth. So what is the most important things that young men can learn from their mothers? So anybody want to you, Curtis, I was raised by my mom. Like my dad was there on the weekends, but it's essentially, I'm, a, I'm still a mama's boy for sure. Um, I love going to my mom's because it's a space that I could just be myself. And one thing that she taught me, you know, despite all the trauma, despite all her experiences is, you know, she had this um, really just unconditional compassion towards me. And as an adult, that's the, probably the number one thing I appreciate about her because through that unconditional compassion that she showed me, I finally learned how to put it towards myself because for a lot of years I hated myself, but I knew that I was just like, you know, what if I could see myself through my mom's eyes? What if I could, you know, uh, you know, treat myself the way my mom would treat me because she did so much for me. 
And so that compassion, right, is I think something that's definitely lacking right across our, our communities, right? So. Yeah, Nista, my, I was raised by a single mother. And um, I think that's the only thing that really like kept me uh, going to this point in my life. I was uh, uh, raised pretty rough with uh, growing up with my family, but I think um, that's kind of what carried me to this point was that unconditional love for my mom <clears throat> and um, being able to feel that way towards myself and others. I think we all got it. The unconditional love from my mom too is probably one of the most important things. And then, uh, I think she always stoked a sense of curiosity within me as well. If I didn't know things, um, she liked to, to be like, let's find out together or I'm not sure, let's do that together. Um, and gave me someone who, she let me know that I was able to go to her for guidance, uh, even if she didn't know the answer, right? She would, she would stoke that sense of curiosity. So when I find out new things, I like still give her a call. And I'm like, guess what? I learned because <laughs> you made me curious about everything. Just wanted to quickly uh, add to, um, you know, I, I uh, you know, even to this date, uh, you know, having addiction throughout my my mother's life, it's to a point where, you know, she's almost hit an 80, but is still, still highly addicted. But there's one thing I could honestly say is that she never got mad at me. And that's going to hold me the rest of my life, even in a spirit world. So mothers, don't get mad at your sons. She gave me free will. She allowed me to be who Lance wants to be. She even said, where did you get, I asked her, where did you get Lance? She said, I was just listening to the TV and I heard on the TV that somebody was called Lance. Which she told my dad at the time of my birth, he's gonna be Lance. <laughs> so that was the, uh, the spiritual part is do not get mad at your, your sons, no matter how terrible they do things or choices they make. Just be there to comfort them. And uh, my older brother is the opposite. He's the mama's boy and he takes care of my mom, which is okay. So I, I honor them both. But uh, for me, it was that independence and to be, to believe in myself. And I had to learn I had to learn by myself, which is okay. Because I have about four other moms that that I could mm -hmm. every day. So, but thank you so much. I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. uh, I got another question here. Uh, and, oh, I keep some, oh, there we go. Uh, can the healing of indigenous men through traditional ways of masculinity be accomplished without a similar change in colonial culture? Anybody else, if anybody is willing to answer that question, or I'll call someone out. So is it like, so I don't, can we just elaborate on the question for a second? Like, what is it asking? Yeah, so I think what they're asking is, is that we, it can, as Indigenous men, can we heal within going through the land in our ceremonies while white culture and the dominant culture is still patriarchy and going the opposite way? Like we can definitely heal no matter what, but the extent of that healing can be definitely diminished for sure. Because for example, I still think in English, I'm never going to be fluently Cree speaking. And unless I'm fully like that, I don't think I could ever fully heal because of the, what colonization has taken away. Because in order, I think to fully heal, you got to be able to, you know, decolonize to the maximum amount so like you know going back to the land and things like that but i but that on the other side of that is like we can heal enough right we can do that inner work where we learn we learn how to cry and i, I know this brought up a couple times but like i was told that you know i've only really started crying in the last couple of years like learning how to actually cry i um, only started crying in front of my wife like two years ago um i cried in front of a whole group of people last summer actually and that was the first time that's happened and what I was taught about tears is that those aren't just my tears. 
right? Those are my mom's tears. Those are my dad's tears. Those are my grandfather's, my grandmother's and all my ancestors' tears. And I'm doing the healing work that they didn't get the opportunity to. And then I'm doing the healing work for the seven generations after as well. And so the crying is a part of that. And I think that if I do enough crying and I'm able to do that in a really healthy way, um, I can do enough healing where I'm still, still me, but I'm still able to, you know, uh, still be a good father and a good, a good person in the community. And that's all I really want. And I struggle with that at times too, still. just wanted to respond to that you know the question it's um i've been doing a lot of inner child work and yes you know healing can happen in in both worlds and that's what our elders taught us to live in both worlds now we have to live in four worlds and that is the spiritual you know to understand what spirituality really means to understand that emotional, that emotional maturity, but also to identify the emotional part is that inner child work. I'm just discovering it. I'm half, I'm over half a century old and I'm finally understanding my inner child. To be childlike, never grow up. You know, that's what you see the elders, they're laughing. And when they're praying, you could see their tears come down. So crying and laughter is the healing, is the most powerful, powerful release. That is true healing. There's nothing written in a book you could study for the rest of your life, but you're not going to, it's not going to compare to, to laughing and crying. It's not going to compare to that reclaiming that inner child, that childlike within you, the child that was left behind. The whole intent was to kill the Indian in a child with residential schools, but I'm sorry it didn't. It didn't work. And I'm gonna share this with my grandchildren to ensure that they know who they are, who they are, why they are, and where they are. And that is the true healing. Even if we, I don't speak black fluently, at least I could, could, could go to the spirit world and say, hey, okay, or tanse. You know, I could still do that. That gives me that hope. And I know grandmothers will be proud of us if we just have that hope. And then next, the healing. So yeah, thank you very much. Hopefully that, that helps. Thank you. I think healing individually is key and most important is us as men. And from there, our families and even our legacies can um, live without the weight of trauma. And um, when that happens, hopefully even our communities can have some kind of ripple effect in terms of our nations or cities or wherever we're living. And um, even beyond that, our, our, our nation as a people. And what I'm hoping and what I dream for one day is that uh, through the healing work that I'm able to do in my ceremonies is that um, uh, someday my, my family will get better and, and be free of sickness. And um, I'll maybe even be able to influence um, our people to, to work together in some way. And then from there, I think um, it, it all starts with, with, um, with us as individuals uh, going to ceremony and healing. And then, um, Hopefully, like the, the other world, the white world will even feel that too, uh, on some level. And I think that um, we've never witnessed the the uh, capacity, the full strength of of our people, of Cree people. We haven't seen that yet. We can't even comprehend what that is because we've never had a government. We've never had our own healthcare, our own education systems, our own, um, unless it was pre-contact when white people weren't here. So it's probably going to take another hundred years for us to to keep healing and to keep um, developing our own nationhood, our own governance, um, so we can probably pro properly advocate and 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 help our people. And when that happens, I think that the white system is going to change as well too, because they can't um, they can't keep oppressing us, they can't keep kill can, they can't keep killing us if we're united and working together. Uh, definitely. And, and the last question I'll ask before we close and that each panelist, some of you have touched on it before, 
but I think it's important to end on even if you'd be willing to share something in, in what you're doing within your healing journey. I know for, for myself personally, it's been reconnecting to ceremony, um, going, starting therapy. I started therapy for the first time this last, this at the very end of the last, last year, um, to then looking at one thing that I want to do this year is go, you know, work with a psychologist and, and really dig deep and, and really put in that work for healing. So to the young men and people listening, what, and to, for, uh, especially for our panelists, what are things that, uh, some things that you have done and are doing and want to do in terms of your own healing journey? And whoever wants to go first. I'll go first. I just wanted to quickly say that there's no mistakes. Don't be worried about error in any sort. Um, I was able to ride in a horse dance this past year. And there was some two young braves that, you know, they, they fell off, but they were so sore that they fell off. They thought they failed, but it was so unique the way we all went to them and picked them up and we offered them. There was, there's always an alternative. So never be afraid, be fearless. And when you want to have a vision, you've got to go on a vision quest. You really want to know how to get through this. Is, is go, go, go on a vision quest. Get an elder and go out and just sleep. Fast. Take a day to fast. Oh, you're going to get some, some spiritual enlightenment so, and the courage to do it. But thank you. That's what I wanted to offer. Yeah, so, so much like you, Curtis, um, ceremony has been probably the number one thing for my own healing journey. And then within that, I had mentioned my, my Cree names of Sao Tim or Yellow Horse. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever seen a horse get broken in, but that horse suffers. Like it gets starved, it gets worked for days on end. And then finally, it comes out on the other side, a better version of itself. And that was me. And it was like, I had to suffer. And over the years, I've learned how to really lean into that discomfort, right? Uncomfortable conversations, situations. Um, for a lot of years, I would have considered myself a man child. Like I just did not know. I wasn't able to uh, articulate what I was feeling. I didn't even know what emotions I felt. I didn't realize I had anxiety. I dealt with depression and everything else. And I didn't even know because I was just so not self-aware. But then I was able to finally learn about these things and then apply it to my life because I'm just, I'm suffering no matter what. Like I'm suffering if I'm not doing the healing work and I'm suffering if I'm doing the healing work. So I might as well learn how to suffer in a healthy way. And then if you ever go to like, yeah, like the Sundance, like you, you suffer, right? You, you, you learn how to suffer and, you know, go to sweat lodge. It's, it's intense and fasting. And so that suffering isn't always, it's not necessarily a bad thing unless you're suffering in a really unhealthy way through addiction, through dysfunction, through violence. But then you can suffer in a very healthy way and you can learn how to suffer. And then through that suffering, you become a better person. And the gift this quickly is that you release your testosterone. That is the gift. You go fast while you get rid of that testosterone. When you get rid of the testosterone, you get rid of stress. And it's it's powerful. You become that, that person you want, always wanted to be. Done. Yeah, for me, what I'm, uh, what I'm doing as well, the pandemic, big uh, effect on the mental health, I think, just like everybody else there. Um, but one thing that I've, I literally just try to be kind is one of my things um, and give the space and capacity to other people. Um, so when someone cuts me off in traffic or is mean to me or something, uh, I try not to take it personal. Uh, what, when something my mushroom would tell me, um, there's somebody who was really mean to him at Canadian Tire, so, uh, you know, how it can be. So somebody was really uh, being mean to him. I was really upset by it. He said, I'm not even mad, he sneezed. Uh, all I do is I feel pity for that man. Uh, it must suck to walk through life with such pain in his heart that he has to feel like he has to hurt others all the time. Let's pray for him. Let's make sure that, uh, that he comes out on the other side with not such a heavy heart anymore, but in a place of 
that he's going to walk with kindness like you and I are doing right now. And so I just try to, that's something I try to take. There's, I mean, there's large scale things that we can all do, but I think it's about the grassroots everyday actions that we do um, that change um, the way that we want to interact with people, right? It's almost practice, uh, practicing kindness and compassion every day. Um, it's, it's so hard, but uh, it's something that we should, I try to do, right? Yeah. I was so happy that Grant and Lance talked about fasting. Um, I think the first time I started when I was like 18, and this was because my mom had cancer. So it wasn't a, a really good circumstance of when I started. Um, but I have fasted every year since. And so I'm 28 years, eight years old this year. And um, I think fasting every year is really, really important, especially for Nehio, um people, men and women to um, get rid of a lot of that cortisol, that, that stress that's in your life, to reconnect, to have visions, to have a purpose, to be able to um, have a, a calming and peaceful sense of, of your life and where it's going and that you, you have an important job from the creator that you need to share with the world. And so um, I, ever since I was 18, I was trained by medicine people to um, learn our ceremonies and to learn our medicines and I was really, really blessed to have that. But I think every one of you and all of us, we, we, we do have those people. We have those elders that are out there that are waiting to, to teach. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them pass away with not, without passing on that knowledge that, um, that their songs, their medicines. And that's really sad. And it's, it's up to us as young men or young people or even, even older men to really go out and seek that knowledge and to ensure that um, it's going to pass on to the, to the next generations. And uh, when I got into law school, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. So I started seeing a psychologist. And for about six months, I went through intensive uh, trauma, inner child trauma therapy. And um, by the end of that six months, I literally felt like a whole different person. And um, I was angry a lot less. I had like um, less of a, a temper. And uh, like, even when, um, when racist stuff happens in public with like, uh, people, I'd usually get set off and like fire off and um, like swear at them or whatever, but I'm not like that anymore. Like it's, it's easier to just kind of um, uh, walk the other way and smile and carry on with your day. And the other important thing to do, um, I believe is uh, exercise. I started going to the gym. Um, I think I, I hit 265 pounds um, when I was in my first year of university, so I was extremely overweight um, and going to the gym, it uh, really, really helped me like every single day I would um, try my best to go and um, I got down to 200 pounds. So I'm at a healthier weight now and um, it really helps you with your stress, even spiritually, it, it really helps you grow as a human being um, to feel healthy and to feel more um, connected. And so, yeah, those are the the kinds of things that I've done. And I, I recommend everyone else try them as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. And then thank you to, to all the panelists for taking the time to be vulnerable, to share. Um, I know it is can be difficult t discussing this stuff because of the potential shame for, for even the things we've done in our past to then to where we are today and, and, and a part of being vulnerable. And I think this is a beautiful panel that um, I'm very honored to be a part of. And one thing that I'd, I want to highlight uh, before we close here is to check out the Moosehide campaign website and make your pledge to end violence against uh, Indigenous women and girls. Uh, I have uh, right here is the Moosehide campaign. Uh, and you can order these uh, on their website and, and wear it. And it's, a, and it's a part of taking that pledge to end violence against women and girls. Um, which is obviously a part, not only step within healing our communities and, and healing ourselves as well. Uh, within another closing remarks, check out the McEwen.ca slash events for other events happening during Healthy Relationships Week. Um, we will again want to thank Kahi Watson for having us here. Uh, and then as we close, if uh, I'll go through the panelists, if you want to say any closing words, and I'll start with you, Grant. No, just, you know, just keep keep going, right? Don't quit. You know, if something doesn't work, try something new and, you know, be yourself. Uh, Keystone? Just if you think you're deadly, 
you will be deadly, right? So make sure to carry that with you as well. Uh, and again, thank you, Kiel Watson and all the other panelists uh, for being here today. Uh, I'm just super stoked. Uh, I, I learned so much. Thank you guys for your knowledge and for sharing what you have with me. Yes, thank you. Uh, Andre? I'm thank you all for being here for listening to me um I wanted to share I thought it was really cool uh Grant's uh, Indian name is Yellow Horse and um uh, my Indian name is White Horse <laughs> so that's pretty cool but um thank you all for listening I really enjoyed um uh, hearing all of you speak and it helped me uh conceptualize a lot of um, my thoughts and understandings of masculinities as well so I really appreciate it and um, I hope that this continues and that this conversation can be carried on, maybe with some other guys and um, other representation, but I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And Lance? Just some final comments. I, you know, my four other mothers and grandmothers, they've always warned me about the trickster, about the dream stealers. And I just kind of wrote down here, never allow the trickster or the dream stealers to steal your passion and your purpose. So I'd like to leave that with you and that when in doubt, your love is a little, is a little bit external, pull it back in by using the evening star and the morning star. And that'll help you to understand, to re regain that love back into your heart so like when we're late at night overthinking anxiety look to the evening star say give me some love give me my love back whoever took it go there and take it and bring it back to me or in the morning you wake up early and you just had a bad dream you go outside and look at the morning star and ask morning star give me back whoever took my energy. I was sensitive and I lost it. Bring it back to me. I ridiculed my sister. I ridiculed my, my brother. Give me peace. Forgive me, please. Help me forgive myself. So they'll give you it back. It's really powerful. So the grand, that's came from my grandmother. So I'm sharing it with you. That's good medicine. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. And, and with that, we will, we will end our panel. And we hope that you're able to take something away. Um, we just want to say in closing that remember to everyone there, everyone listening, that if you are struggling, uh, seek help, seek support. You're not alone. There's many people that I'm sure have faced uh, that are facing similar struggles and, and, and that you can overcome it and that uh, there are people out there that will help you and support you. Uh, love yourself, be gentle, and have a good evening.